Recording has started. The content of this video will be uploaded to YouTube, so um, be careful what you say. <laughs> um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Open Cluster Management Community meeting. Um, today, we have David Eads joining us to talk a bit about the Open Cluster Management API design. Um, David is someone who's involved in the Kubernetes project since the very beginning. And we're extremely lucky to have him involved in the Open Cluster Management project as well. Um, so David, thank you for joining and please take it away. Sure, so there are several different APIs that, that we build on top of. One of the most difficult to follow is, is probably the placement API. Uh, and and to understand why it's built the way that it is, uh, there are a few pieces of, of the API model that are worth going over. So I'm going to share a presentation here that I've built, and I'm happy to take questions while I'm going through this. So uh, hopefully you guys are seeing a screen, uh, and it has a slide deck, and um, I will just go ahead and start here. So um, one of the things, so placement starting off with, with manifest work, and it seems like an odd place to start, but uh, it's important to understand how the APIs connect and how they, they are not connected. So manifest work solves a problem of how do I get my first management add-on somewhere? Uh, and so the, the manifest work is actually very simplified. It doesn't contain information about here's where you should place me. It doesn't contain information about here's how you distribute me to all these clusters. Uh, it says this is what you should put somewhere. Uh, and, and that's the core of, uh, that's all it is. Uh, and the idea then is that we would build on top of this to provide cluster add-ons uh, and then separately, we would handle the scheduling aspect. How do you know which clusters to place things on? So the placement API has two parts. Um, they are the placements themselves that say, this is how you can select a managed cluster. Uh, and it's sort of like a cross between a service definition and a pods node selector. So the uh, it it well, I'll get into all like all the different fields and why the fields are specified the way they are, um, but that's like conceptually what it is. It's a way to select managed clusters, and then there's this concept of placement decisions, and this is where the output is. This is where we say these are the clusters that match the placements that or match a particular placement, and this is shaped very similarly to endpoint slices. If you are familiar with them in Kubernetes, where uh, we know we're going to be selecting a lot of something. Uh, we don't want to place them all into a single uh, resource because it ends up being a, a point of contention where a lot of things try to update it. They get very large and they get very busy. Uh, and instead, we're going to have um, these placement decisions that only contain, you know, like 100 choices and it can have multiple of them for individual placement. So the goals when we designed this API were to try to make placement decisions something that another component could build on top of and to be able to be understandable as to as to why a choice was made. One of the issues frequently that comes up in Kubernetes is why did my pod end up on that node? And it's actually, it can be very difficult to try to figure out the answer to that question. And so that was one of the original design goals. Uh, another is that a placement decision should be consumable without re-implementing how the scheduler or, or how the placement controller actually works. And that is a result of another uh, another point pain point in Kubernetes of of well, okay, there's this decision, but and I know I can know what goes into it, but how do I configure myself to replicate it or something? We wanted to avoid that. Uh, and then the, th the third thing was that we wanted placement decisions to change over time. Um, they are, this is where they differ from pods. So a pod is sort of a fire and forget item. You don't get attached to it. 
Um, and it'll run on a node, it'll disappear, and then maybe another pod will get created, maybe it won't. Um, but you can actually see where that started to hit some limits uh, as we have projects like a descheduler that have to come along and function. And, and if you're familiar with how the descheduler works in Kubernetes, you actually ended up having to program your descheduler to understand what your scheduler did in order for it to function effectively. Uh, and placement decisions, one of the goals is try to try to avoid doing that. Could we create an API that would allow us to handle those needs over time uh, without having to build a second service that had to be configured in exactly the same way? And so let me let me pause there and see if there's questions about about what what these APIs control and what the goals that they have are. All right, well, that's going well then. Um, so, so there are a lot of degrees of flexibility in this particular API, uh, and that's why I decided to focus on on this one. Um, and it starts with how we know, like how many how many different levels of selection are there, right? Like uh, in in your first thought, it would just be like, well, I've got these managed cluster sets. I have these managed clusters. I want to select some of them um, and and put them in a list. This should be like pretty easy to do. Um, but it turns out that that we have maybe maybe a half dozen different ways, or no, probably just four ways of selecting them, uh, and then some additional ways of prioritizing them. So the first actually comes down to why placements are namespaced, uh, and they are namespaced so that you can choose a subset of managed cluster sets to associate with them. And, and this is a point of control where someone who is an, an admin across all these clusters has the ability to say, uh, I'm going to set up these workload um, namespaces. I'm gonna have a, a user controlled aspect where they can say I can create something, um, but they're only gonna be allowed to place whatever it is on this subset of clusters that I give them. And and they will not be able to change it. And this is um, this is sort of analogous to, to the way you can have a namespace level control on a node selector in Kubernetes. Not all deployments turn them on, but there's actually a way to say uh, pods in this namespace can only get associated with this subset of nodes. They can restrict themselves further. So I'm gonna let you have nodes A, B, C, and D, and then a pod can say, I only wanna be on C, but I won't allow any pod in a certain namespace be placed onto node Y. And, and this sort of allows that capability. Your capability. Uh, the next point of configuration is actually on the placement itself. Um, a placement set can then choose what managed cluster sets from the set it's allowed to choose from it wants to apply to. Uh, and this can be used to prevent to prevent accidents of selection where you can say like uh, I have access to three different cluster sets I know that I want this particular thing to only ever be on this subset of them. Can't imagine why, but maybe you only want it on Azure or only on GCP or, or you know, I guess I should also pick on IBM, which applies only from IBM here. Uh, so, um, you know, maybe you only want it on one of those. Um, and, and this is a way, if you know how your managed cluster sets are shaped, to do that. And so that set then, so now we have, we can sort of, uh, you know, if I've been smart, I would have made like a little bubble chart here. So we have um, this sort of large set of all cluster sets. Then now we've scoped it down to the cluster sets for a particular namespace. Uh, and then we've scoped it down to the cluster sets that a placement specifically chose. And now from that list, it's possible to choose a predicate. 
uh, this is directly analogous to a node selector. So you can say, I want to select managed clusters that have labels like this. And there's also a, a peer to it. You can choose instead to say, uh, have cluster claims like that. Um, and the cluster claims, uh, believe has a separate proposal. I can try to find that if there's questions about it, but, um, that one is a way for a cluster to say, this is something about me you should know. Uh, and, and they get replicated into the hub. And so now we have the full set of all potential targets. And, and at this point, we can say, okay, given these targets, is there anything that we need to exclude? And these names are actually lifted directly from, from the node scheduling world. Uh, we have this concept of taints and tolerations. Uh, the toleration effects are slightly different uh, because there isn't a concept of execution. There is a concept of uh, don't select me to begin with, and then a concept of don't select um, if you um, don't select for new clusters at, or don't select even though you previously selected me. Uh, and this is a way for a managed cluster to say, you probably don't want to be here, right? It is things like, well, there's a couple special ones that are uh, managed cluster hasn't checked in. I don't remember the name of it, but there's a, a managed cluster hasn't checked in or it's not ready. Uh, but it's also going to be things like, you know, this managed cluster is going to go down under maintenance, right? Uh, and it lets a workload owner decide, okay, by default, I, I'm going to honor these things. But I happen to know that this particular thing that I'm placing is so important, it needs to be there even if this managed cluster is tainted. Uh, and often those are going to be things that you use for managing of these of these spoke clusters. Um, right. One example might be distributed Loki. If you have that set up uh, and you want to have that everywhere, no matter what's going on in that cluster. And that would be a good reason to use a toleration. So at this point, we have our set of nodes and I almost want to draw a picture right here. But let me let me ask, is, does the actual node selection, it's or sorry, uh, the managed cluster selection at this point make sense? The different levels that we have. Where's my little bubble for a circle? Um, we have the overall of uh, everything. I don't know how to make this thing type. It takes forever for me to make slides. Uh, so this is all managed clusters. And we're going to restrict this to the set of managed clusters uh, in the namespace, right? So this was what was bound to our namespace. To this. Uh, and then from here we have the set of uh, cluster sets selected on the placement. Uh, oh wow, that text needs to get smaller. Uh, and then we have the set that gets label selected. Wow, okay, so it's getting really small. Uh, do, do, is there a, have it been clear so far? You guys just aren't gonna save me for myself. You're gonna make me yeah, finish. I think, <laughs> I think that's clear. I think one of the feedbacks uh, that we got from many people is that, uh, I think from the beginning users, uh, when they try to use a placement, uh, they have to, understand the cluster set and <laughs> cluster set bindings and then placement. So uh, I'm not sure whether is there any possible way that we could simplify for the entry user. Like they, they probably just want to create a placement to select clusters, but some okay. Yeah, this is some feedback that we get. So, so expanding this out, that would be 
this point right here is where it starts getting strange. This this list here is where like why do we have this level of flexibility? It's getting in my way. Yes. Okay. It's, that they, it's almost that they forget that, you know, they don't real, it's realizing you had to do that step because there's now a bunch of steps <laughs> to do it. Okay. Um, that is, is good to think about. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, sorry, my, my OCD is just requiring me to do this and you're all watching. Um, so thinking about that, it would be possible. How do they feel overall? How do you feel overall about um, about the way in which we restrict placements from two or restrict um, which clusters can be selected from which workload namespaces? Right now, that is is a very strong requirement. Uh, it's the way we're set up out, out of the box. Uh, does that serve us more than it hurts us or no? I, I I'm going to say it serves us. Oh, sorry. Go, children. Sh huh? Yeah, I think that serves us, but um, that just to provide a learning curve for, for the new users, I mean, for the entry users, like... They need to understand that. Um, so maybe it's just how we, I don't know, how we. we I mean, I we, think it, yeah, I'm with you. I think it kind of is how we document it and, you know, how we, well, we make that onboarding process. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we've, so, we've, no, go, David. Oh, I was I was just going to to say uh, I'm I'm one of those people who very rarely read directions, so I'm sympathetic to all those people that didn't read the directions. But I mean, if you didn't read the directions, I don't think you'd get this set up, <laughs> <laughs> like at all. <laughs> okay. Because you okay, so let's I mean, so let if you walk through what we have here, you have so let's just say we have a managed cluster. We needed to create a cluster set resource. We needed to put a label on that managed cluster to connect it to that cluster set resource. I then needed to create a binding from that cluster set resource to the namespace. And again, this is like the zero day flow. It's just, it's a lot of, there's a, you know, I've, I've got three connections I've just mentioned that I had to do. And then I can create a placement that hits a subset or the, the, it's either the complete set or the subset of that specific cluster set. Now, if I have more than one cluster set bound, it will, you know, go across both of those if I don't specify I want to use one within the placement set. But, like, yeah, it's that, you know, so there's no way you would have got that without reading the manual. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so thinking about it, I think there are some things we could do to help you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so... We in, in Kubernetes, oh gosh, uh, 119. So it wasn't around when we started these APIs. Um, and it was beta back in 119. I think we, we made a GA later. We added the ability to give warnings. And it seems pretty reasonable to me to issue a warning if you create a placement somewhere uh, that does not have managed clusters uh, bound to it, right? Uh, and, and it does, I think, today. So, well, you'll get oh, a condition yeah. in the status. Ah, well, that well, was, please, yeah. It's not that different. You can actually yeah. get a warning. Uh, so, interactive on the CLI, yeah, uh, it will actually pop up and say it can say warning. Uh, you have none of these. We still let you create it, but if you're going interactive from the CLI, it'll show it to you. Okay, well, we definitely want to extend the condition to be to include that then, and that would be definitely a step forward. In, uh, and the same so thing with the cluster. <laughs> I'm going to actually go ahead and write, since, so I don't forget here. Um, so there is something called a cube API warning returned synchronously to client. Uh, and displayed by Kubernetes. Uh, we used it for our our beta deprecation warnings. So uh, it's there, it's GA now, and it's a thing that you can add 
with, uh, well, you have to add it with an admission webhook, but it can be added there. Uh, so that could help you at this step right here. When you create this guy, yep. you could give a warning. That would help, let's see, that would help a little bit and you could probably point them and like say, you need to bind this thing. Um, there are also cluster set API changes. I don't know whether that's gonna help overall or hurt, but it makes it possible to have an all cluster set, yeah. which might be easy to put into to, um, startup flows. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that we should actually have a default cluster set that like a global one? I don't know if I would go that I don't know if I would go that far. I would certainly put an all into into like a getting started flow, right? I guess you guys probably have one uh, have something there to help people get started here, but but an all is sort of I could imagine it being a common case. But I don't know if it's common enough to make default. Okay. But you don't like. I guess I was I was leaning towards default in that if you didn't specify a cluster set, we would put you in the default cluster set by default, and and maybe well maybe give a warning actually now that we have the option that says hey reminder you need to use the cluster set. That's like we haven't forced there's it isn't forced that you can't create a managed cluster today without a cluster set but like because you can't use placement without it it's almost like I almost have a feeling like I guess I'm leaning I lean a little towards maybe we should be putting you in some set and maybe if it's a default there's you know you don't have to grant anybody access to it if you didn't want to and then it can be moved by the admin to a specific cluster set that represents a region or a you know a pillar within your organization or something like that versus just having a generic all although i think i don't know i feel either either moves the bar a little bit which is good for that sort of first flow or first time use yeah my i guess there are in Kubernetes a, a certain resources that do get created by default. Uh, obviously the default namespace, although if I have to be honest, I think that was a historical mistake. If I had that one to do over again, it probably wouldn't exist. Um, but another example might be something like RBAC. If you think about what happens in a cluster in Kubernetes, it actually creates a bunch of RBAC resources by default. And if a cluster admin decides, no, 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 I know better than, than the Kubernetes system, uh, they can take control of those and change them or, well, they can change them. They can't, they can't actually remove them. They have to exist to block it, but they can stop them from functioning. Um, do you think something like that could work here where we created a, um, a, cluster set that includes everything and then allow a user to change the annotation to say, no, I'm taking control of this now and now it selects nothing if they found it offensive to their sensibilities for some reason. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yep. Does that, and are you familiar with the mechanism that I'm talking about in RVAC? It's about yeah. the bootstrap or RBAC, right? Right, it's a bootstrap RBAC, and then there is um, there is an annotation on those roles that says uh, that they are no longer under management. So let's see, uh, now that... I say, I'd say now, but I think it's actually gonna be like two or three releases from now. Based on migration, is that right, Jim? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, say since we'd say later. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's see. That would help people get through. That would help people have a cluster set to start with and know that they had messed up when they create a placement in a spot where it will never have 
where it will never match anything. Yep. Sounds good to me. Yeah. And all right, so we are now at the point where they have to specify the label and claim selector. I would actually have to look up the default, see whether it selects all by default. Remember what we did there? Uh, yeah, I think we so by default it's all. By default it's all. That sounds like what I would have done. Yeah. All right, so that means that then their empty resource that they create, or mostly empty resource, would actually select stuff. Okay. I think those would all be improvements. Um, now that, so once we reach the point of having gotten these set of clusters, we have the prioritizers. And do, do users have trouble understanding how the prioritizers interact? Do we know? Uh, I think that we we had we just uh, put that in the API. So I'm not sure whether a lot of people have starting to use that yet. So okay, uh, that but, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I can I can see it. when I when I looked at the API, I actually thought this was the most complicated part about um about the placement API. I had not it had I had not really thought about that initial learning curve of how do I get anything selected here. So okay, and that means we probably also don't have a whole lot of feedback yet on um on how well the steady works alongside the others. Right? Yes. Okay. I am interested in whether someone, whether anyone else has anecdotal, like, yeah, you know, I tried this and it was actually hard for me to do. But I did go ahead and briefly explain the ones that we have here. Uh, I think the add on that got added recently was also a good step forward. So in the end, this was done with a goal primarily of how do we externally use these? How do we reuse these sets of clusters for other purposes? Uh, and, and there was a lot of work to get here, but in the end, when you view it on the outside, you just say, I want to list out the placement decisions for my placements. Uh, and then I use a list watch for the updates. Place them there. So I need to copy this, is some, was someone copying what I sketched in here to the notes uh, as places to look at next to try to improve the API? Yeah, 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 I will do that. Okay. Awesome. Sorry, I, I have trouble talking and, uh, and writing at the same time. Um, are there questions about any of the other APIs? So I, I want this one was one that I thought was the most complicated one that we have, but I'm happy to talk about the motivation behind behind any of them, how they have you know corollaries or not in in other APIs. Hi David, uh, actually we have another feedback from uh, about the placement APIs because now we can. Uh, select uh, many cluster by using the cluster site. You know, we recently have a proposal to enhance the class site to select cluster by uh, any labels. And while we also suggest the user to use the placement API to select the placement, to select the cluster. So the people may confuse which one should used to select cluster. One is a cluster site, another is a placement. What do you yeah, that, that that is a very good point. Um, I think that they serve two slightly different, well, 
they currently serve two slightly different purposes. Um, the, the cluster set is a good way of choosing a super set of clusters that are suitable to use and providing a point of control by the, the multi-cluster admin, the, the person who's admin over everything. Um, and that is a reason to use a managed cluster set instead of trying to have direct selection by, by a placement, right? Because it, it separates the responsibility into, this is the set of clusters that you're allowed to use, use them how you will. And these are the clusters out of the ones that I'm allowed to use that I wish to place my things on. Is that, I can, I can appreciate that's a fairly fine distinction. Um, but if the distinction makes sense, we can, try to, we can try to make that distinction clearer. And if we don't think the distinction makes sense, we should try to figure out how we can reconcile those two roles into a single type. I, yeah, I think the feeling was in the the overlap of using the selector that if I had multiple cluster sets and I was so ignoring for a second the fact that placement has the capacity, you know, some additional things beyond label selector under a lot of the use cases that this discussion came up. It's just it's either match labels or the match expressions, in which case if the cluster set was choosing clusters based on a match expression or a match label having to create the placement rule is just extra work <laughs> was kind of the was the comment we we got out of it but from a security perspective you know it'd be only the admin that'd be able to probably cre that could create the 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 actual cluster set but again if you're not you know if it's a group you're going to hit all the time why do I need these, you know, the extra placement rule was sort of the question we kept getting. In a world where cluster sets selected on namespace or on labels. As well. Yeah. Um, or generic labels instead of the fixed label like it is that just makes it part of the group. Yeah. So, so in thinking about that, a lot seems to come down to how frequent how frequently there's a distinction between um, the the cluster admin or the, or the person who can actually say these are the managed cluster sets I'm going to control them uh, and I've I've called it a workspace admin here I don't know what's called in in the external docs um, but the person who says I want to actually put my work somewhere I want to put it anywhere I'm allowed to place my work uh, and and honestly I don't have a feel for that how often is there that distinction. Because that's why those two are separate types. Yeah. Right. They're separate types so that you can have two actors working on this, and and someone can use uh, a a managed cluster set, but not control membership of that cluster set. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So I think, and that's an honest question. I, I honestly don't know. I, I would expect it to come up fairly frequently that these would be different actors because the idea of trying to combine it. And uh, I guess I don't know if it is or it isn't. I don't, I don't have a good answer for you either. It's, I, I yeah, just that it's, you know, our, our the persona is often the admin or it's coming through a GitOps space where it's being reviewed before it gets applied. So, you know, if it was really just all cluster sets, it would still work in our cases. Now, is that going to actually, it, would that be a case where you may actually want to make it such that some higher level construct that would use either a placement decision to get managed clusters, or they could potentially choose to have a managed cluster set reference. Yeah, that would be an option as well. We could use the reference and get the and do it on a cluster set. But I, I, <laughs> that would, I that would end up that, breaking your workspace admin, wouldn't it? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't... Yeah, I don't know. Um, so I will... I'll actually take a note here to try to describe that distinction better um, because that is a very fine distinction. And, that, and that's why it exists. So we use this, like in Cube, there's an option, like I said, for scheduling where a cluster admin can come in and say, inside this namespace, you're only allowed to use these. And it doesn't, it doesn't get used on every cluster, but the clusters where they wish to use it, they are heavy users of it and they use it to good effect. Yeah, I guess, you know, and so a comment that came up was that if, you know, again, this is ignoring the fact that we have some of this capacity, the new stuff with the capacities and the and the sort of sorting orders, etc. Was that, you know, I if the cluster sets are sort of label based and I needed to further filter, why use an additional resource and not just put the label in my higher level construct that's consuming this anyway? So I point at the cluster set and then I just filter the you know filter labels myself. Oh, I see. Yeah. Again, it's not. Dealing with the fact that we've got, you know, capacity, and as we add more and more things, there are more and more draws into placement. It's just that mm -hmm. it was, if it's, if the cluster set can be so closely mapped to a placement rule for finding things, and and maybe this is just because, and I said the word word placement rule there, is because we play with placement rule today, which is kind of like having an all cluster set, all your clusters in an all cluster set, and then being able to sort of go across a an entire place, which is maybe where the, the folks that were having questions about this were, huh? were coming from. But anyways, but yeah, that, it's just, this is, I, this is stuff that came up. I, I'm all on board for cluster sets because even outside of placement with the namespace binding, like it's a great RBAC way to be able to have my controller cross a namespace boundary and know I'm secure to do something on a cluster, which I couldn't do before that, <laughs> before this. So I've been, I, I am actually a big proponent of it. Yeah, I, I want to make it as easy to work with as possible. Uh, yeah. So so finding the, finding where it breaks down, where it's hard to use or where it's hard to describe, like why, why would I choose to do this? Why is this good for me? Yep. Uh, it, it's a useful exercise. So I like this, this is good. Uh, has there been feedback about uh, taints and tolerations? That is actually another issue that is difficult in, in Kubernetes. I see a lot of questions around why do I have a no execute here? What does the no execute mean? Do I need to worry about it? How is it different than a no schedule? How are we doing there? Uh, I think we have the API ready, but we didn't implement the feature yet. It's okay. in progress. I think okay. that there's a uh there's a strange requirement uh that about that they want to define a maintenance window for the cluster. Like you can set up a starting time and end time for the for the cluster. And that cluster is not can cannot be selected in this time window. Um, you think that we it's probably a good part for the placement API or it should be another one that just leverage tint? I think it's a pretty good fit here for the placement API. Um, to be able to say uh, the expression of negative selection of, of uh, oh, what do we call it? might probably use the word repel, uh, to be able to say you should prefer not to land here uh, is really helpful and, and distinct from, from positive selection. The use case around maintenance is interesting, and I think it actually does a really good job of highlighting why somebody might want to tolerate it, right? Where you say, I'm going to go going to go into maintenance mode and you can say no new workloads or you can say I'm going to go into maintenance mode and uh, and this is on the taint effect right you can have the taint effect and say no no new things placed here or you can put a taint on that says uh, the things that are here should leave 
And then on the toleration side, you can say like, okay, yeah, most things should leave, but these things are special. And then not having to have the layers that currently consume placement decisions understand the rules around uh, around those taints and tolerations and and how the toleration latencies work, I think is an improvement here. But I'll take feedback that says it isn't once we have it. Uh, but like in my head, that looks like a good design choice. Okay. But was the, Shojen, was the ask actually like for when we say window, like a time window? <laughs> Yeah, that's you have a starting time and uh, the end time. Oh, uh, I would anticipate. I, I would have expected that to be done by the um, by the agent saying, "And I'm now going into the maintenance window," rather than trying to do it in um, something in a in a placement API, right? Because it's actually going to be controlled by the taint on the managed cluster. You can see that when we um, when we taint certain nodes for maintenance or for compromise, right? The examples that people have there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that makes sense. Well, uh, if there's if there's nothing else, I, I'm glad I had the opportunity to come here and talk about this with you. Uh, I wish that I had built this chart initially uh, and rest assured that if I ever present it again, uh, I will, because I think this presentation right here uh, is actually a good one to come back to. Jump to those slides, makes it a little easier to understand. Thank you so much, um, David, for joining. Um, are there any additional questions? Um, we have only a minute left. Um, before that, I just want to give a quick shout out. In our Kubernetes Slack, um, we drafted a, our uh, Kujang and Josh, Josh drafted a proposal regarding orchestration API by leveraging the placement API that we just discussed and the manifest work. So if you have any comments, um, please head over to the Kubernetes Slack and see the Google Docs and, uh, for your feedback there. Thank you, everyone. Well, I guess that's it. Thank you. <laughs> nice. Take care, everyone. Thank you, David. Nice. Thank you, David. Bye. Thanks, David.